I don't even know how we came so far, so fast. It's been an amazing journey for me. Um, it's not the first time I'm teaching something, but it's the first time that I have taken such a huge challenge with so many bright people who want to, you know, learn and go into the world of development. And I'm pretty satisfied with the results that we have achieved. Like all of you, you have persisted so far and all of you have been here for the past eight weeks every time, every week, with a lot of output in terms of homeworks. Um, I'm really satisfied. I really didn't expect this much perseverance and commitment from you. And it made me really, really happy. And here we are on the last lecture. Um, today we're going to talk about deploying our apps. So if we look back, we started with the basics of programming, of JavaScript. We created classes. We went into Node.js and we created backend applications and models on a file database. And then we started using MongoDB and we tested our app. Everything works fine locally and we guaranteed that they are working with our tests. And now is the time to actually deploy them to a real life server on the internet and you know, see the, the results of our hard work and maybe also show it to our friends. You can send the URL of your service to your friends and tell them how to interact with your APIs and they will be able to interact and create records in your databases over the internet. That's, that's an amazing journey. And yeah, I would like to therefore start by thanking you first for taking this huge challenge and you know, doing this journey with us. So hopefully this, this week we will see how it all comes together and we will maybe, I don't know if this is a nice way of putting it, but we will put the final nail on the coffin by sending our um, code automatically to, to a cloud environment. And we will hopefully see how to scale it up and down so that you know, it can withhold any load that the internet can throw us. Um, all right, so a few questions. Raise your hands if you have Docker installed locally. That's great, that is dedication, thank you. Raise your hands if you have a Docker Cloud account. That's great. And again, a DigitalOcean account. That's perfect. Um, all right, so hopefully you'll be able to follow me through. This time I wanted you to, to fork my repository um, because you will basically be deploying the app that I developed and, and demoed all the way, um, not your own apps, which will be your homework um, for, for the graduation. But the idea is I already put a lot of files and um, configuration for you for deploying your applications, um, which could be a little bit longer if you had to do it for your projects today. Therefore, we'll start with the template that I already prepared for you, but you will be deploying it to your own Docker Cloud account and to your own DigitalOcean servers um, with your own URLs. And hopefully you'll do the same thing for your projects um, during the weekend and will be ready for the graduation. Raise your hands if you will present at the graduation. That's great. Um, the rest of you who don't consider presenting, um, you should. And because why not? I mean, it's the celebration of our journey and the results, of course they matter. Of course it matters if your app is running and working, but even if it's not, give us a chance to celebrate your progress. So just show whatever you have done so far. And it doesn't have to be a complete picture. You'll find out later in your career that there is never a complete picture. There's always improvement, always room for growth. So no application is ever done, ever finished. So if you are waiting for it, if you have some doubts in your mind, like, hey, I actually couldn't finish everything that I was aiming for, that's normal. That actually shows that you're on the right path. If you had already finished everything you had in mind, 
that that would be more troublesome, that would be more problematic than because there would be no room for growth for you. You'd be like, okay, like I've done everything, what's next? And if you can think of something to do in the coming days, in the coming weeks, if you feel the, the void of some features and some, some further development, then you're on, on the right track. And that's how we know that you are ready to present. Um, so please, please do show us something um, next week on Monday so that we, we celebrate your progress so far. Um, do you have any questions so far? Are you excited? I'm really excited. Um, because like this topic is maybe the hardest. Previously, I've talked about debugging and testing. Hey, you have a question? In the previous weeks, I've talked about two subjects that software engineers struggle with, but nobody wants to do. One was debugging, the other one was testing, right? And the problem is people hate it, people don't want to do it, engineers don't want to do it, therefore, you know, it just drags on and on, and people struggle with debugging and testing all the time. Now, this topic, the topic of this week is really weird and interesting. Everybody wants to do deployment the right way. Everybody wants to automate stuff. And you know, everybody wants to have a very, very smooth development process and experience. But again, not a lot of companies can achieve that. It's immensely hard. It's really difficult. So today I'm going to present to you an end-to-end -end solution that basically will make it a breeze for you to develop your app, to test it, and to deploy it automatically without any hassle, with just a single command um, from, from your terminal, basically, or IDE. And this is something that we kind of try to do at our work, at UNU. Um, but even there, we are not 100% on this track. So the stuff that we will learn today is something that people will discover maybe next year or maybe in 2019 even and if you know all of these if you can practice and repeatedly practice all of the stuff all of the materials um, in this week then you know you'll be a very very strong candidate for engineering in, in companies for devops because you will know the best practice of deploying an application to production and all right so that's why I'm really really excited for this week I want to start with talking about something called the developer experience raise your hands if you have heard about user experience before UX okay user experience is maybe you all know but um, it is a field of research that tries to make things smoother for the users. Like when, when they're using our applications, they should run into less problems, less trouble, and everything should be as intuitive as possible, as easy as possible. Um, basically, the, the usage of the app should be pain-free, right? That is the idea. And this worked great for the users. It has delivered immense value to the businesses and to the users as a result in the past years. 
But nobody actually ever thought about the developers. And I would like to introduce a concept called developer experience, the X, um, which is really, really important. If we want to improve the UX for our customers, that means we have to ship fast. We have, we have to deliver um, fast and as fast as we can as developers. And that's only possible if the development experience is good. If you have, you know, as a developer, if you can write your software, test it automatically, deploy it automatically in just a matter of minutes, then we are talking. Then you can deliver value to the customer. Then you can focus on user experience. People blame developers for not caring for the users, but that's mostly because developers are frustrated themselves. They are trying to solve their own problems. They are always constantly fighting with the system, fighting with their development environment. Like, they change something, it takes 20 minutes to build their application. What do you expect? What motivation do you expect out of that engineer? It just doesn't work that way. So, this concept of developer experience is gaining some traction lately. Um, in the community, in the engineering community, and we will see more and more on this topic in the following years. But the idea is, if you can improve the, the experience of a developer developing an application, then you can expect more and more value from them. And this thing that I'm going, going to demonstrate today is actually a, a way of doing that. We will talk about automatic deployment, automatic testing and deployment of our applications which is really a breeze for, for engineers. It actually makes it fun again to deploy your app, to see it live, um, to see that it won't break, and to see that you as a developer can scale your application, that you are in charge. Because some of you may know or already may have worked with teams of infrastructure management at companies. There are usually server administrators or system administrators departments in companies and they basically hate developers. They don't give any access to any running production environment to developers. They don't let developers own the job. Therefore, there's always a constant blaming game. So developers blame the sys administrators, the sys admins blame developers. You know, I checked out your code, but it doesn't work on our test server. What do you mean? It just works on my machine. And if that's my responsibility to develop it, and it works on my machine, then I don't care, says the developer. And then the infrastructure guy actually builds up a grudge against that developer um, because their job is to deploy the code and it just doesn't work. So this is a problem the IT industry has been trying to solve for years and years. And finally, we have the means to solve it very, very easily. So now there is a shift of responsibilities in development teams. Um, beforehand, we had application developers, engineers, and system administrators, completely separate departments, completely separate responsibilities. And you know the, the infrastructure guys didn't know anything about software, couldn't write software. The software guys, the developers, they didn't know anything about infrastructure. They didn't have any access on infrastructure. And this created a lot of tension and a lot of um, back and forth, loss of productivity and motivation. So we decided to change this. And basically, we, as an industry, we came up with something, some concept called DevOps. Raise your hands if you heard DevOps before. Yeah, cool. Um, it's basically a new role, a new definition, and um, a new set of responsibilities in the companies. And DevOps engineers make sure that infrastructure is available and accessible to developers. So they may write code for the application, but they mostly write code to automate stuff, to automate the infrastructure, so that there is no black magic, there is no, <coughs> sorry, there's no manual configuration of servers and, and your infrastructure, but everything is automated for the developers so that now the developers can step in and take ownership of their product. So if you're a developer and if you are asked to develop a feature, well, you develop it locally, you test it, you push it to your test server, you test it there, and then you're also responsible for pushing it to production environment, which is the 
the globally available web page or server. So there is no one else involved. Infrastructure people are no more, actually. They are replaced by DevOps people who make sure that the system is sane and it's working and it's automated and developers can take responsibility for their actions. This basically removes any blaming that can happen because now developers have no one else to blame. Everything is automated. They know what to do exactly to put their code to production, which you know could take weeks before, but now it's basically a matter of minutes. And yeah, it's a huge shift in responsibilities and teams really, really struggle to adopt this new scheme of, of basically team building and infrastructure engineers who are used to maintaining Linux servers, for example, are unfortunately on the decline. So they are asked to improve their skill set. They are learning automation. They are learning programming because one of the good ways, best ways to automate stuff is to program it, is to program some um, special software to do stuff for you. Much like we program tests to automate testing, we program other software to automate deployment processes. And yeah, so this is something that you should read more about, DevOps mindset and how important it is for today's IT industry. And for example, currently in our team, um, we have a lead DevOps engineer, David, who was here before. He is basically responsible for making sure the system is automated and it's available and it's accessible. He basically set the groundwork for um, the automation and then developers come in and basically do what I will demonstrate today to deploy their application every time they do a change. Um, so that basically as a manager, for example, I don't have to first go to a developer to get a feature done and then go to the infrastructure guy to get it deployed. Um, I just talk to a single person for a single feature and I know that that person will be responsible for the whole journey, the whole lifetime of that feature. So yeah, this is, this is really important and it's really, really big in the industry. There are countless tools that are being published every month um, or maybe even every week to automate deployment and something called integration. And as I told you, everybody tries to do this and they kind of fail. So today we will see an end-to-end -end system and you'll see how practical it is because that's been my goal for, for the past eight weeks. We tackled every subject and we basically simplified it down to a level that is digestible within an hour or two. And deployment is actually not much that different. Once you know the best practice, it's actually straightforward to get started with. Okay, um, so how could we achieve this technically? The biggest problem was, again, the production systems were really complicated to set up and to maintain. Basically, infrastructure people had to log in manually to remote servers and you know set up Linux, set, set up special software, database software on each server and maintain it and deploy your code, even if there's some automation involved. The, the setup was mostly manual. Um, apparently, it doesn't work. It doesn't work if your business is dynamic. It doesn't work if your team is big. It doesn't work if you have constant improvements and deployments. So stuff should be automated. The first thing is to make sure you can automate setting up servers and deploying your code or other applications like MongoDB, for instance, to those servers automatically without doing manual configuration and like zero configuration. Um, there are already tools on the market to do these for us. And today we're going to talk about one tool called Docker Cloud, which is part of the company Docker. And raise your hand if you heard Docker outside this context. I ask you to create accounts, but great. Um, so Docker is a company which came up with the idea of something like a container. Raise your hands if you heard containers before. Cool. Um, containers are like virtual machines. 
or like let's say real machines that are really tiny and in fact only um, in the memory of a container uh, of, of a computer and they simulate servers so for example previously we had servers dedicated to databases right and right now what we have is we have a pool of servers all are similar but um, we then create something called a container and we say hey this container is responsible for running mongodb and that container itself in itself thinks that it's actually a computer on its own but it's actually a program it's just some very simple mechanism that wraps mongodb in that case and that runs mongodb this gives you complete isolation because on every machine you can have hundreds of containers running at the same time your node application is also deployed as a container and your tests could be another container any other software that you are working with or any other database in your application could be a single container on its own and they would think that individually they are separate computers they have an IP address, they have memory, they have CPU it's like you're setting new computers from scratch but in fact they are virtual and they are really lightweight so they're more they're lighter than virtual machines if you are familiar with the concept of a virtual machine containers are actually much much lighter and you can simulate for example if you're running on Linux you can simulate any Linux distro so you can simulate an Ubuntu or Fedora I don't know Red Hat or you know more lightweight Linux distros and you can deploy your applications fairly easily this has the added benefit that once you have a container running anywhere it is guaranteed that it will run everywhere else so what if you set up a container on your local machine and if it works for you it is guaranteed that it will work when you deploy it to a server because you create something called an image from your application or from MongoDB for example you create something called an image you can think of images as um, dumps of a CD if if you are old enough to see CD-ROMs um, we were ripping the CDs and we were creating images of those CDs right um, this is basically the same thing you take your application and create an image with that application and it's immutable wherever you deploy it you make sure that or docker makes sure that it will run so this is immense in terms of um, productivity because this removes the developers um, complaint or I don't know that that sentence that when they say it works on my machine um, but then you notice that it doesn't work on your server this completely eliminates that because you exactly know what is set up locally and there are no external software that might affect uh, your application or for example we are using node 8 point something um, as a node version you make sure you use a specific node version and not any other version in your container or in your image and this makes sure when it gets deployed to the server what regardless of um, whether there's a Node.js installed on the server or not since you are deploying the image to the server it runs the specific node version that you set up so if you can do this um, locally if you can build an image locally then um, it can be deployed as a container everywhere else that is running um, docker and it will work 100% exactly as it worked on your machine so this is basically bringing the production environment to your local computer this is what we do you define in production how your application will, will run its dependencies like MongoDB and then you run it locally with containers locally it runs on a Mac OS or a Windows computer or a Linux computer um, with I don't know it's a single machine right locally it's your laptop but when you deploy it the same thing with the same configuration can be run in tens of servers in any cloud like some of them could be in AWS some of them could be in Google Cloud Platform some of them could be in Azure it doesn't matter as long as you have a definition of images as long as you built the images and you ship them 
it doesn't matter where you deploy your code as long as you have Docker installed. They will work exactly the same. So um, I hope I could illustrate how this improves the lives of a developer because now you eliminate the dependency on an infrastructure person setting up the servers for you. Uh, beforehand, for example, 10 years ago, we were at the mercy of sysadmins and you know we created tickets on our um, issue tracker for upgrading PHP version, for example. Hey, like there's a new version of PHP, could you maybe upgrade it? And then they would do it manually and they wouldn't do it because they didn't know if it would break other software or not. Um, therefore, stagnation over stagnation and we were helpless. But now, as a developer, you have all the power to decide whether you want to upgrade one of your dependencies. And there are basically no infrastructure people involved at all. The idea is to remove magic and write everything down so that it's repeatable. Setting up an environment is repeatable. With a single command, you can set up your environment on your machine and remotely on your production server farm. And yeah, hopefully I will demonstrate um, that. But do you have any questions so far? Is it confusing or could I give you the idea of why this should work this way? Like automation all the time, all the way and immutable environments. You set it up once and it runs everywhere. This could be a free discussion as well. Just raise your hand and say something. Last week it was really fruitful, our discussion. I really loved it about testing. So we could do maybe a similar thing this week. Nobody? Please? Yes. Yes, it is. It is actually comprised of several layers of changes. So you could think of it as like Git. Git, where you store commits as commits upon commits of your changes. Um, we will be actually storing um, change sets again at the file system level. And I will talk a little bit more about that. But basically, whenever there's a change, there's a new layer in your image. And you cannot remove layers. You can only put new layers on top. That's how you get immutability. That's how you get um, nice caches as well because you can cache images and their output. And um, that's how you build up an image. But in the end, it's a single thing that you download and set up. And once you get an image, you can run it everywhere. You can pull any image. I guess there are millions of images right now um, within Docker. They have something called Docker Hub, which is an online web application that brings together millions of images like MongoDB, MySQL, PHP, Node.js, WordPress. You can even deploy WordPress with a single click to any server when you're using Docker. Um, there are images built by people, made by people, which you can clone and run again anywhere. Um, in the world, whether it's your own local machine or a cloud server, it doesn't really matter. Any other questions or, or remarks about deployment, about um, developer experience? Some of you are um, developers, you have development experiences. Um, maybe you have some experiences with sysadmins um, when they turn down one of your requests, for example, of upgrading something or adding a machine You know, it was so hard previously, like even five years ago or six years ago, it was so hard to maintain a production server environment. Um, when as a developer, you saw that your application needed a little bit more server power, a little bit more CPU or RAM, you were actually afraid to ask a sysadmin to give you a second computer because it meant maybe a work for two, three days for that person. Like they need to set up a new server, allocate it an IP address. Maybe they don't have enough space on their 
virtualization environment to create a new server. They need to set up the specific versions of software that you're using, which is probably outdated because your application is old. So they can not, maybe they won't have access to old versions. And they have to make sure that it's working, that the accounts are set up, that you can log into that machine to debug it, etc. It was really, really hard. Um, but nowadays, it's just a single button. You just say, hey, I want three more servers that will run this application. And the, the automation software, and we call them orchestration software, does this automatically for you. OK, um, last chance for speaking up about your experiences or any questions that you may have at this point. No? Please. Yeah, there are or there were um, other competitors, but Docker was really, really good. And basically every other company adopted it in the end, and it became an open standard now. So please. Uh, so that's one of the losers. <laughs> I have hated Vagrant um, since its inception because it's um, the worst compromises in this in this thing um, we don't need virtual machines and we don't need to uh, manage or maintain virtual machines which is what Vagrant is doing um, but we need a mechanism to quickly spin up a new instance of, of, of a software which containerization gives you um, so there is no need actually to create a, a virtual machine um, to run PHP or MySQL for example um, and yeah, I hope they are already dead now. If somebody is using Vagrant, they should immediately stop and move to move to Docker. Um, but hopefully, most of you did. Yeah. Um. So. The funny thing is, Docker is actually running on virtual machines most of the time. Your, like any server that you rent on AWS, for example, is already a virtual machine. But since it's really heavyweight to create and run virtual machines and to manage them, we just get a fixed set of virtual machines as a server farm. And then on top, we run our applications in Docker containers. So we have physical servers, real, uh, machinery that run virtual machines in them that run docker in them and most of the time it's actually docker in docker and sometimes in docker so multiple layers of docker containers running within each other um, but that's mostly um, mostly hidden to to a developer so i would say as far as we are concerned yes we shouldn't be dealing with virtual machines but obviously, if you're setting up a data center from scratch, of course, you need some hardware, some real machines, and then some virtual machines running on top in order to be able to um, make use of Docker efficiently, let's say. Um, but yeah, that part is done by DigitalOcean, by AWS, or any other cloud provider. And all we do is, hey, like this is the machine, and just set up these containers there and run my application. So you almost always use um, use Docker containers. Does it make sense? <laughs> um, any other questions? Anybody? No. Okay. Then I'm gonna start with the example application. Uh, raise your hands if you cloned. Um, sorry, forked my repo. It's important that you fork it and not clone it um, to your own Git GitHub user. Um, I will try to go slowly, but I may not be able to do so because there is a lot of stuff that I want to cover. Try to follow me. If you can't, um, try to stop me. And if we see we lose some time, we will move on and I will ask you to follow me later um, after the class. But the idea is we will deploy this application that I developed through the course to one of your servers. Um, and you'll be making changes 
you need changes on your own, therefore it's important to, um, to fork them to your GitHub repositories. Um, we will basically start with checking out the branch week 8. So you are probably on the master branch, you do git checkout week 8. The changes we see are mainly about um, Docker. I mean, I added some new files here. I will talk about them in detail. They mostly start with Docker because they are Docker configuration. Um, as I told you, to eliminate the, the, um, the it works on my machine syndrome, we ask the developers to use Docker locally on their machines as well. Whenever you're developing your software, if you remember, we previously wrote Nodemon, right? We were doing this before. You are not allowed to do this because who knows which version of Node.js you are running on your local machine. You should be running the same thing uh, as in production and Docker is the best way to do so. So you should be running your application in Docker even while you're developing. Um, Another change that I had to do is in database connection. So previously, the, the path localhost and WTM, my URL for the database, was hard-coded. And I changed it a little bit to allow anybody to override the database URL. So this is called something um, as an environment variable. Raise your hand if you know what an environment variable is. Um, Cool, most of you know it. Um, basically, it's a setting that you can do in runtime before you run your application. You can set some variables and you run your application and your application can change its behavior depending on the values of, your, of those variables. For example, here we are looking for db underscore URL variable. If we have such a variable in the environment, we are using that as the connection string to MongoDB. If you don't pass in a DB URL and uh, we're not passing in a DB URL locally, then it just tries to connect to the MongoDB that is running locally on your machine. So when you started with Nodemon or Node in Next.js, um, it just tries to connect to your local MongoDB instance, but you can give it a DB URL like this and write something like um, another DB URL and then start Nodemon and it will pick up that MongoDB URL and try to connect to that. So this is a way to make your application configurable so that you can override these settings in runtime, which means, for example, probably you will have a different database in your test environment and a different database in your production environment. How would you manage that? you don't want to hard code them in your code base. You make use of environment variables to connect to a different database. All right, so it's already set up for us. Um, the second thing that I'm going to show you is something called a Docker file. Docker file is the blueprint for building your applications. And it actually represents the actual steps that is necessary to build your application from scratch anywhere. So if you had, you know, um, a bare bone hardware, like a new installation of Mac or Linux, what would you do? You would first install Node.js, you would install Git, or uh, to check out your code, or I don't know, any other tool to, to get your code, and then you would do an NPM install, right, to install the dependencies, and then you would run it by running a command. So this is basically telling the same thing in code so that we give this to the Docker runtime or Docker software so that it can um, repeatedly do these operations for us. It starts, every Docker file starts with a statement called from. From defines the base image. So the base image is node. I want some image some other people created that includes Node.js. So it's like creating a virtual server um, from scratch, 
and then installing Node.js on it, but other people already created and prepared a ready-made image for us, so we don't need to do that. Or, you know, I could also do from Ubuntu, um, like this, and run, um, I don't know, something like this. So I don't need to do this. Someone else did this for me. What I'm doing is I'm using um, the Node.js image. And after the um, column comes the tag name. So Alpine is a special Linux distribution that is very, very small. It's around 8 megabytes in size. So deploying it is super fast. In comparison, an Ubuntu image takes around 350 megabytes. So it's really, you know, whenever you're making a change, you're pushing 400 megabytes to your servers, which is a little bit more um, than what should be what it should be. Um, so Alpine is really uh, tiny. It has a very small footprint and um, it runs very well. I didn't actually indicate any version, but I could actually do I think something like this. I'm not about I'm not sure about the exact tag name, but this would mean um, give me a Node.js image that has version 8.9.0 installed, okay? Um, but I just do this, which will get me um, the, the latest Alpine image. Okay, so that, that's a special Linux distro that has Node.js built in. And then I say, this is the working directory on the hard disk. This is not a full-fledged virtual machine, but it thinks it is. So obviously it has a hard disk. And I say, I will deploy my code under a directory called app, okay, on the root file system. So I declare my working directory as app, and this actually does something similar to cd app, for example. So it goes into the app directory. Then I say, let's first add package.json and package.log.json to that app folder. Remember, our current folder is app, so this relative path actually points to the app folder. Um, and then I'm doing an npm install. And then this basically installs all the dependencies that I need. And then I'm adding the rest of the files. Now, this is a nice trick. Actually, I could do it like this. This would also work. This would be the same thing. But there is a very... Um, cunning trick. So if you remember, I told you that Docker works in layers, containers and images work in layers, right? And those layers are unique and they are repeatable, they are cacheable. So when I'm using the from statement, um, I'm getting a cacheable version of an image if somebody else prepared for me. Uh, I change my directory, this is another chain set, this is another chain set that is committed that can be cached and then I'm adding my files, all right? This step is also cached, and then I'm um, running npm install. npm install takes a long time, right? On your machines, it takes around a minute or two to install all the dependencies. Um, Docker caches these changes by um, comparing the differences, okay? Comparing the differences that are made. Now, think that you developed your app, you pushed it, you created a, doc a docker container by adding all your files and then running npm install, everything is fine, right? Then you change your application because you're developing it, you made a new commit, and the second time you're running your docker build and you're adding the files, now you get a different image. Now you get a different chain set because you changed some files. Therefore, you have to run npm install again because the previous layer is different now. So the cache is broken. Once the cache is broken, I cannot make use of it anymore. So I have to run npm install again. But do I actually have to run it again because my dependencies didn't change? My package JSON didn't change, right? How do I know if my dependencies changed? I look at package JSON. If I see another version of a package that I depend on, then I know that there is a change in my dependencies. 
that is when I should run npm install. So going back to the setup that we had, that's why we're adding package JSON first and then doing an npm install. This makes sure unless package JSON changes, this npm install won't run again. It, this npm install statement will only run when there's a change in package JSON. That is perfect. That is what I want from caching. So that this will run only once, and unless you change your package JSON, you can skip this npm install completely. And it will speed up your development immensely. Then, basically, we add the rest of our files. Is it a little bit clear why we first add package JSON? It's because we want to make use of caches. And if a file changes, there won't be any cache. So um, this is a very, very neat trick. But that's all. And all we do is we declare a command that needs to be run whenever you run that container. We say node in Next.js, right? This is how we ran our apps. We wrote node in Next.js. This is everything you need to set up your application and make sure that it will run everywhere. This is the def definition of an image. And we will build an image out of this definition and we will deploy it to or send it to Docker Hub so that we or anyone else can pull it and run. And yeah, our application will run. Obviously, this doesn't um, declare anything related to MongoDB, but that will follow. Uh, is this clear for you? Is it easy for you to digest? It's easy, right? Yeah, question? Please. No. Yes, we don't need to create that app directory. It will create it for us, which is really nice. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, these are... Yes, this is an instruction on how to get the environment ready to run your application. It says, first install node and npm, and then create a directory called app, um, add some files, package JSON, do an npm install, add the rest of the files, and then run node in Next.js. It, yeah. Um, so this Docker file is within our folder, within our project folder, and all the code is actually already there. Yeah. So we use this add dot, which means this means this current directory that I'm in, to the current directory I'm in the container, so slash app. This basically adds everything that is here to the app folder in the container. Um, obviously, you could give it another folder, but I mean, why? This is already there. Um, any other questions before we move on? No. Okay. So this is how I declare my application. All right. How do I declare MongoDB so that I don't have to install MongoDB locally? What you did before is a tedious work. You downloaded MongoDB. You have to open it or launch it every time you want to run your app. Um, some of our tests failed last week just because we didn't have MongoDB running. Um, and that's just one single dependency. Our application could depend on a lot of other software. Currently it doesn't, but it could. So actually this is the first level of instructions. There's another layer of instructions on top, which tells Docker to create an environment that is ready for your application to run. You basically tell it, hey, like this is my application and then I need MongoDB and another dependency to, to run this. So just do whatever you want and give this environment to, be, to me. Um, this is achieved via something called a Docker Compose file. Um, so it is in YAML format and we can focus on the first part here. In 
almost 20 lines, I define my application. So let's first start with MongoDB. That is my uh, dependency. I just say, hey, I need a service. I need a container called MongoDB, which will act like my database server. And its image is MongoDB image. Just get whatever the latest version is. Or you could say, you know, 3.4 or something like this. Um, actually, you can look it up, the actual version you want to use. And if you're fine with using the latest, you can just type latest. And it will just fetch the latest MongoDB from the cloud and run it without any configuration at all, without um, you having to mess with sudo and root and etc. Um, so this is all it takes. And then in my application, this is my application, the definition of my application. In my application, I say I'm depending on MongoDB. Okay? So launch MongoDB before you launch me. Because for me to run, that there needs to be a MongoDB running. So this actually eliminates the problem we had with tests last week. Because when you have this, you don't forget that you will run MongoDB alongside your app. Whenever somebody is running this Docker Compose file, and I will show you how, um, MongoDB will be automatically created and, and run. Um, all right. So the second thing that we need to focus is this build statement. I'm giving it a Docker file. The Docker file that I'm using is, in this case, different than the Docker file I showed you. I showed you the, the production Docker file, okay, that creates a Docker container to run in production. Um, but locally, my needs is a little bit different, tiny bit different. That's why I'm using a separate file called development Docker file. And now let's look into that. So a development Docker file is just a little bit different. So on the left, we have the production Docker file. On the right, we have the development Docker file. Raise your hands and tell me about the differences. Anybody? It's like children's games, find the seven differences between two pictures. Anybody? Please? We don't include all the files, yes. Why? Kind of. Um, look a little bit closer. There's a new directive here. Raise your hands and tell me what new directive you see there on the right. And directives are in red, if you didn't notice already. Please? Volume, yes. We say that app is now a volume, which is another name for a hard disk, which you can plug in or plug out. So we say, hey, the app folder is actually a separate hard disk that will be plugged in later, not now. And that is the difference, basically. On the left, you were adding all the files manually to the app folder. On the right, you say, hey, app is a hard disk that the developer will plug in afterwards, like after creating this image. So we don't do anything, um, anything with it. Um, we just say, hey, whatever is under the app folder will be available still in the container, but we just don't define it now. It's a volume, and we just prepared the bed for the volume, and some people will plug in or attach, we call, um, a volume to this folder later on. And if you look here, in fact, we're doing a very similar thing. We say, hey, take this current folder, okay, and attach it as a volume under the app directory. So in fact, when the container is running, it has access to all the files on my hard disk. I'm not copying the files over into the container, but the container directly approaches and makes use of the files on my hard disk. Why do you think we are doing this?
Sorry? Quicker development, yes, but why is it quicker? Yeah. Um, if you look at it, we are using a different command. We're using nodemon on the right for development. Why did we use nodemon on our local machines before? To watch for changes and reload the application, right? Because that's really good when you're developing the app. Whenever you change something that it reloads, it's really good. It's really nice to have. That is what speeds up development. If we had to compile our code and build a new image all the time, although it takes maybe one or two seconds, it would be tedious still. So with the production Docker file, and it's perfectly valid to use the Docker file on the left locally for development, um, you still need to wait for building that image every time you make a change. Yes, the first steps are cached, so you just do this and then run Node.js again, but it's still a little bit tedious. It still takes some time. And we want to use Nodemon. We want to watch for changes in the file system. That's why we are using a, an external volume that is mounted to the container, that is attached to the container when we are running it. And it's in this Docker Compose file. We say, hey, take this current directory, attach it as a hard disk to the running container, so that whenever I change a file in my application, in my local hard disk, Nodemon will pick the change, will pick up the change, and reload my application. Does it make sense? So that's why I'm using a separate image um, for development, because I'm really lazy and I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait to rebuild that image, even if it takes a few seconds. I don't want to wait for every, um, every file change. And I will demonstrate that actually um, in a second. Um, all right, then I have some environment variables. For example, I declare the database URL and I say the database URL is MongoDB. There is a very nice feature in Docker. You can um, connect to other containers within your Docker Compose file. So MongoDB is another service. That's another container, which is like another server, all right? You can actually connect to MongoDB from your app service or app server, let's say, just by typing MongoDB as the host name. So these names should match. But once you say um, MongoDB, you can actually connect to this machine. So there is no need to know IP addresses. There is no need to plan for IP addresses and ports and etc. They are already connected for you. And they already know each other. All right. All you need to do is to write their names. So we say, hey, the database actually will be MongoDB, will be called MongoDB. Um, if you look here, the, def the default value was localhost. This is for running the application out of Docker on your own computers, on your own laptops. But we have this um, MongoDB already set up there. And in fact, this is currently locally one single laptop that I have. So obviously it will run on, on my own laptop. But when you deploy it to a production environment, probably the database server will be different, right? Um, so how do you connect them? Normally you would write an IP address, something like this, I don't know, an IP address of the database. But what if the, that IP address changes? This was really hard before. 10 years ago, people really suffered to do this. Like it took maybe days sometimes to change these configurations. But we skip all of those and um, just use the name of the other service. And Docker or Docker Cloud or Kubernetes, whatever orchestration platform you have, makes sure these two separate machines can talk to each other wherever they are in the world. This is a huge opportunity for developers. Um, and then if you remember, we had the port 3000, right? Some of you have 5000 as a port. Um, we just say, hey, um, the local port in my container that this application is running on is 3000. But I want this 3000 to be also available on the server. 
or on the computer this container is running in. If you remember, we were connecting to our application in the, uh, in the browser by writing localhost colon 3000, right? Um, so this basically makes sure that you can still access that, um, that 3000 port and still reach your app. Um, all right, one nifty feature is something called the load balancer. Raise your hand if you ever heard of a load balancer before. Yeah. It's usually the, the, the first point of contact for you when you want to visit a website. Load balancers take your request and then redistribute your request to an array of other servers on the backend, get a response and give that response to you. Um, therefore, you can scale the number of backend servers that you have, but when you have a single load balancer, um, your application will be basically be able to scale much, much easily. Um, so this is a very special load balancer built for, let's say, Docker Cloud or for your local environment as well, which picks up the other containers that you're running and start serving them on a domain. Obviously, if you're running this locally, then there's no real domains included. Um, but this is the first step to basically release your app to the public. All the applications that you interact with have a domain, right? Google.com, Facebook.com, or Medium.com, or um, I don't know, GitHub.com. They all have domains. So if you have a domain already, and if that domain is pointing to your server, to your load balancer server, which is something to do with DNS management, if you can get that, and I will help you uh, do it, if you will, um, until the graduation, you can actually tell your load balancer to serve your application from that domain. I will actually demonstrate um, a, how it works to you today. So, this app says, I'm a virtual host. This is a concept that you should read more about. Um, but it says, I'm a virtual host. I'm a web application, and I should be available at the URL app-local.arm.ag. So whenever people go to that URL, they should see my application. Okay, And this load balancer picks this up and sets up special rules so that whenever a client comes to this load balancer and says, hey, I actually want to go to app-local.irm.ag. Could you help me? The load balancer redirects those requests to this app so that your application is available to everybody on the internet. You can, all, of course, write any virtual host here. I think this is a um, comma-separated list, so you could do google.com. If you change your DNS locally, obviously, you cannot change the DNS records of google.com. Actually, you could. There was a bug. Um, people could redirect Gmail, but Google fixed it. Um, but you can locally define where the domains should point to. If you redirect, if you say that um, google.com should point to my local uh, machine, you can actually you know, reach your app through google.com domain. Obviously, only you will be able to do that, but still, it's something. Um, it's a nice pun to play on your friends who are not that technically um, capable. All right, um, any questions so far? No? This is basically a file that I prepared, and I will give this to Docker actually something called Docker Compose, and it will run this for me, and I will have an application up and running in no time. So, let me show it to you. If you have Docker Compose installed, you can follow me. And actually, please do follow me if you have Docker installed, and let's see who is able to run this. But the command is as simple as Docker Compose up. So I just run this Docker Compose up. And 
obviously it was um, it already had the the images built because this is not the first time I'm running it but you will see that it's downloading Mongo and setting up Mongo and then building your um, Docker image and in the end you will get something like this your application is up and running so instead of node in Next.js we run Docker Compose up and it makes sure MongoDB is running, it makes sure the load balancer is running and you get really nice logs out of it. For example, the app says it's listening, so we're listening. MongoDB um, has some logs and load balancer has some logs. And I will actually go and see. So it's available localhost 3000. It's the same as before. This is only available because in my Docker Compose file, if you remember, I defined the ports. I said, hey, this container is listening on port 3000. Expose that port. Pair that port to the port of my computer 3000 so that I can interact with it. Oh. So that I can interact with it, okay? So let's now go and change this hello template. Refresh it and see that it's updated. So, where was that template? We use index pug. It's here, right? Okay, didn't update. Well, kind of did, but I don't see the change. All right, let's go to, for example, person one. I have this. Let's change the, the root get ID. So All right, I save it. Oh, the pug files are ignored because they're already automatically updating. Um, but the JavaScript files are watched. So when I save the file, you saw Node1 is restarting, okay? And it started Node in Next.js again. This is the same as the development setup that you had before. And we get the log again, server listening. And in fact, you also see MongoDB it says there's a new connection from this IP, which is my um, local container IP. And you kind of also see that our application connect to the MongoDB instance, okay? Now I go and refresh this, I will get a log here, getting person one. So I will delete this, save it, and it will automatically refresh, okay? So this is basically the same setup that you had before working locally, but your experience is a lot improved because you don't have to manage MongoDB yourself. You don't have to install MongoDB. So you don't have to uninstall MongoDB as well in the future. And basically you don't have to remember that you have to run MongoDB before your application. It all happens automatically. Another benefit, and this is the, the biggest benefit is this is the same environment as the production environment. In production, I will do the same thing, and it will run. Now is the question, how do I do the same thing in production? I told you that we will be using Docker Cloud, right, for, um, for managing our servers and our applications in, in production. There is another YAML file that is very similar to the one before. So we have Docker Cloud here and Docker Compose here. We use Docker Compose to run stuff locally. Some orchestration tools allow you to use the same Docker Compose file in production, uh, but Docker Cloud doesn't. It has a very similar syntax. But this is what we do in Docker Cloud. Basically, we still define our app and we still define MongoDB. It is very similar as you see there's just this added um, directive that says restart on failure which means whenever there's an error in my application 
just restart it. Instead of failing it completely, just restart the application so that it's always on whatever, um, whatever happens. And the load balancer is there again, and the application is there. So, oh, one thing. This app local rm.ag. I was listening to this virtual host locally, but I didn't demo that. Uh, I was just using localhost here. So, oh, I will update this to app local rm.ag, and you will see that it still works. So now, actually, although this is on my local machine, I can use the host that I set up. How did I do that? That is through some configuration called the hosts file. Raise your hands if you know what a hosts file is. Okay. It's basically a system-wide configuration that is used by your operating system to define which domains should be served by which IP addresses. And if you see here, I have a definition. 127.001 points to my local machine. It's my local machine. It's the IP of my own laptop. And I say app local ARM AG should be redirected to this IP address. Okay? And this is kind of a spoiler um, because I will be deploying the production version of my app to app ARM AG, this domain. And I set it up to point to my server. This is the IP address of my server that I will be deploying. Actually, I deleted that server already, so I will need to update this. Um, but then I will be able to use this host name for connecting to my application. Please, there will be a there. Okay. Um, so, again, we have Mark here today with us. He's an expert in Docker and Docker Cloud. So he will help you with all your problems. And obviously, other people as well. Uh, we have Juan and Miri and Jessica here. Cool. All right. Um, so we were talking about Docker Cloud YAML, and I already showed it to you. I said, this is what we're, we will be running in production. Maybe the biggest difference is this restarting on failure. Um, you could have the same thing on locally as well, as well, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense because we already, we already have Node 1 locally that is restarting our application whenever there's a crash. So um, the rest is basically pretty much the same. And for ports, this is important maybe. For ports, we don't have double 3000. And raise your hand and tell me why. Tell me why we have only 3,000 here and not both. On our production machine, we didn't write the second 3,000. Why? Yeah. Yes, kind of. But another explanation, anybody else? Why didn't I define a port on my production machine? No ideas? Yeah, kind of. But why? Um, yes, but there's another reason related to that. It's very simple. It's because I don't want to expose my application. This is my server running my real life application on the cloud. I don't want anybody to mess with the internals of my server. So I don't expose my application to a port on the server itself. I'm using the load balancer for that. I mean, I could even delete the, the 3000 here locally so that my application could only be reached through um, this app local ARM AG, okay? But I said, you know, maybe 
Sometimes, since when I'm running it outside Docker, I use localhost 3000. Maybe I still want to do that. That's why I add this here, so that this is available locally on my computer. This opens a port on my computer, so that my colleague can connect to my computer, for example, on the port 3000. But in the production um, setup, I basically don't make use of that feature, which would be a bug in production because I don't want to expose my internal server. I just expose my load balancer. See here, I'm listening to port 80 and 443. This one is for HTTP, this one is for HTTPS. So this is the only thing that I'm exposing to the outside world. So nobody has direct access to this app, okay? Um, but only the load balancer. And the load balancer is the one who is redirecting and forwarding those requests to this app, which makes my app more secure. A little bit, please. Here? Oh, here. Yes, but this is for local communication. So this just tells the system, Docker, that my application listens on port 3000. But that's not exposed to the outer world. Yeah, exactly. Good. Any other questions? This system is already really hard to hack. You just expose your load balancer. That's all. You don't expose your application. Any other questions? Please. Yes, exactly. That's a very good question. How does the load balancer know which port to use, which port to redirect to? It basically just takes all the ports that you write here, that you define here. It just assumes if you're defining a port, it's probably you're exposing a web application. So whenever there's a request coming in for you, for this host, it just forwards it to this port. Which makes sense, right? Any other questions? All right, it's time for a break. Uh, we have 15 minutes again, and then we'll meet and deploy this to production. Every one of you who have followed me so far will be able to deploy this to a server. So there was a mistake here in the development Docker file. It actually doesn't install, um, doesn't do npm install. I will fix that and send you the updated development worker file later, but the easy fix is you just do npm install locally, and then it installs all the dependencies, and then you need to do docker compose up dash dash build to rebuild the images um, to make use of those um, new newly built um, files. So, but this doesn't affect our production code because we have a different docker file for production which works 100% um, here, this docker file. And actually, what you could do to get this running is even locally in your docker compose, instead of development docker file, you could just run the docker file. So this is the production docker file, okay, that is used and when you do docker compose up, it recreates that app.js and yeah, we'll do the npm installs for you and then run it again. Anyway, so I have a question. Does it feel like there is something missing that like all the stuff that I've told you, I claim are enough to run your code on a real life server and have automation all the way through to the end. Does it feel like there's a missing link? Or like, hey, is this all? Like, isn't there anything else? Anything? How do you feel? Because again, this is all that is needed to, to run your applications. We will just put this on a server. 
Sorry? Yeah, and, and now I'm going to show, show you how to do that. Um, okay, for this, let's go to our Docker Cloud. CloudDocker.com. You should follow me. I will set up Docker Cloud and all the integrations that is needed to to run the app. So first you'll be in something called the swarm mode when you first log in. Um, here you turn it off. There is a toggle button here. Turn off the swarm mode, which is another mode um, which is still in beta, so we won't be using that. Okay. So this is the, the screen that you have. Um, anybody played around the screen here? No one? Cool. Um, let's first go to cloud settings. All right. And yeah, so you'll see a list of cloud providers that Docker Cloud can work with. AWS, DigitalOcean, Azure, and two others. And some source providers, GitHub and Bitbucket to listen to your code to, you know, to build your projects. And you can get some notifications through Slack or email. And your billing details, hopefully you don't need those. Okay. So first, I click this connect provider next to DigitalOcean. Okay. It will take me to DigitalOcean. I give it my personal account. If you have your personal account, do this. I invited some of you to WTM BJS. You should select that one, if it asks, of course. Um, okay, what? All right, so it's connected. I click this and it connected. Um, if you set up your own Docker Cloud account, um, you have a code here to get free credits from DigitalOcean, $20. You click that, you take this, paste into DigitalOcean um, billing settings so that you get $20 in servers for free, which means you can run your um, servers for a few months for free. And it's enough to, um, to try it out. So the next thing that I'm going to do is since I want to set up an automated system, I want Docker Cloud to directly fetch my code from GitHub, build it, test it, and run it in production, okay? The next thing I'm doing is I will add my GitHub account to it. So I click Connect Provider again. It automatically connected because I had connection previously with GitHub, but it will walk you through some screens. So do those. And the last one I'm going to use is Slack connection. Just click this. It will go to our Women Take Makers Burden Slack. If you have any other Slack organization, you can choose the right one from here. This is basically to receive notifications about our system. Docker Cloud sends automatic messages to Slack to notify us of changes that has happened in our application. All right, so I will just choose to send it to Slackbot, which is only private to me. Um, you could choose and um, troll any one of your friends, but you shouldn't do that. Um, either choose Slackbot or nothing. So I authorize it, come back to Docker Cloud, and I click everything so that it gives me notifications about everything. Um, you can also choose only failures, which, mean, which means it will only notify you when there's a failure in the system. But I'm a control freak, so I want to get notified of everything. So everything is good. Um, even when you're buying a donor, you want everything, right? all the salad, all the sauces, everything. Alice, 
Um, so that's good. And that's all the settings that we're going to do here. We connected our DigitalOcean account for Docker Cloud to be able to spawn new servers for us. We connected our GitHub repository so that it can read our projects from GitHub. And then we turned on notifications for everything on Slack. All right? Raise your hands if you followed so far. That's great. Perfect. Um, all right, now I want to automatically deploy my application. Before that, there is one final thing that I want to show you, and that is Docker Compose test YAML. I figured out that I actually missed on that one. Um, this file is a specific file for Docker Cloud, which is used to test your application, okay? So Docker Cloud will pull your code from GitHub, it will run this file, this Docker Compose file, to test your code, and if it succeeds, then it will deploy your code to production. So that if you have nice test coverage, you will know that you won't break your applications. When your tests fail, you will make sure that your application will not be replaced on production. You will not have a new version on production. You can only have a new version when all your tests pass. Does it kind of make sense? Um, so this is basically automated testing. That every time you deploy a new version, it will check um, for the test. What, what is significant here is we need to have a specific service called SUT. This is predefined in Docker Cloud. And we say, hey, build this local directory with the local Docker file and run npm test. If you remember, this was the command that we were using to test our applications, right? And the same is, basically the rest is the same. We have an environment variable to point to MongoDB and we have a MongoDB image. We don't need to expose any port here. We don't need a load balancer here. And that is only because this is only testing. So this is not real life service. This is just testing the app internally. Therefore, we don't need a load balancer. We just need to run this npm test command. All right, is this clear? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so basically Docker Cloud will make use of this test file to test our um, application, all right? Um, so I'll go to repositories. Again, follow me. Repositories are kind of like GitHub repositories, but these are Docker Hub repositories, repositories of your images that are built. So your own, your very own projects, all right? Repositories of your own projects, Docker images of your projects. And I will create a new repository, okay? And instead of dealing with these, I will click here. If you see, this, is, this section is building automatically. Auto build triggers a new build with every git push to your source code repository, which is what we want. So every time I push to GitHub, there will be a new build and a new version, and it will be deployed to my servers. Everything will happen automatically, all right? Cool. So I click this GitHub link, image, I select the organization, dash SW, and then I select the repository. You should select your own fork. That, this is why you actually forked my repo. Um, you should select your own GitHub and your own fork. OK. And when you click this click here to customize the build settings, you see that it will build the master branch and tag it as the latest image. Latest is the keyword that we use to get the last version of the image, if you remember. It's just a name. It doesn't mean anything. It could be anything. Uh, but the convention is to use latest. And you could actually add more rules here. If you have other branches, you could build each branch separately. So you could have something like a test branch, 
and take it as test. Or you could have a production branch and take it as production. Or you could have something based on a regex, a regular expression, so that you know when it's a hotfix, build it. When it's a version, a new version, build it, whatever. We don't need those. We'll just use the master one. Okay, now why can't I create? Oh, the repo name. Sorry. Yeah, you need a you need to type something here. Um, anything would work. WTMBJS. In fact, it should be the same name as this one. So WTMBJS dash eight for me, but obviously it will be different because your username will be different. So I'll just use this one, WTMBJS, eh? All right, and I just click create or create and build. Both would work. Oh, this repository already has a build source. I guess I clicked twice. All right, I have my repository. And yeah, these are my recent builds that I tried last night. Um, okay, yeah, I can see my older builds. Probably the screen will be empty for you. Raise your hand if you could follow me so far. Good. Um, is it building for you? Um, I click create and build. You could also do the same thing. It will build an image automatically for you. Otherwise, we'll manually trigger the build. Anybody clicking create and build and see that it's working here? Maybe you see a yellow icon here that it's pending. Get a ping? Oh, here. No, it just says it could connect to GitHub. Um, you can trigger the build here manually. If it's not building for you, just first run the manual trigger. Um, there is some setting that I will ask you to do in the configure automated builds section. You can choose to build on my own nodes. This will make use of your own servers, which we will define in a minute. Um, but this will be faster because Docker Cloud's infrastructure is slow and you'll be in a queue which you'll have to wait for two minutes or three minutes before you can build your application, so it's not good. Our servers are free, so we can use our own servers. Sorry? Ah, I like the dark. Um, Okay, and auto testing, you can test pull requests if you're working with multiple people. Um, internal pull requests are pull requests that are created from the branches of that repository. External pull requests are created, uh, are the pull requests created from other contributors from their own forks when they want to merge something to your own repository. So this one is better to test everything that is coming in, um, that, that this thing will build and test it. Any questions? Questions? Yeah. Um, so a repository is like a GitHub repository. It's just a place on the internet to host our files, our images, and a container is actually the running um, computer, let's say. Your application runs in a container. A container has a file system, hard disk, CPU, and memory. It's like a virtual machine that is running. Um, containers are created from images, which are created by building them. You know, we did we used Node.js image as the base, and then we put our own software on it, run npm install, and we created another image um, locally as well. And when you run it, it's called a container. And the repository is where we host these online. So we just created a repository on Docker Hub 
which is something like a GitHub. Actually, that's where the name comes from. All right, let's create a new server, shall we? I go to node clusters and I click create. Here is the node clusters and I click create. It asks for a name, I will say app. You don't need to give it a label, but you could discriminate between your node clusters by using these labels. So one label could be load balancer, one label could be database, and the other label could be app, so that application servers go to the app um, node cluster, database servers go to database node cluster. It's a little bit of an advanced um, setting that we don't need right now. So hopefully provider DigitalOcean, you can choose that. You choose Frankfurt as a region, as that is the closest to us. And you can choose any type of, of machines. So our app is very small, so it can run in this 512 megabytes um, computer. But since we will also use it for builds, um, I would like to use the two gigabyte version. And it comes with a disk size of 40 gigabytes. Now you can scale up the nodes here but in order to create 10 nodes, you need to sign up with a credit card for Docker Cloud, which we don't do, which, we, um, I mean, you could if you like, but it's not free. Um, the first node is free, so we'll just use a single node. But this is actually how you scale your application in the future as well. It's just a slider. Um, so do this configuration and launch node cluster. And it will show it here. It's, it's, it will say that it's deploying. What this does is it goes to DigitalOcean and creates a machine for you there. So you don't manually manage anything. You don't even know the IP address. You don't have any login to this, um, to this machine. It just creates the machine for you. You can go to the details of the server and see the timeline, see it's deploying. If, if we could, uh, no. Anyway, <laughs> it will deploy. So, node clusters is deploying. Anybody who is deploying their servers right now? All right, that's good. So let's go to the other configuration. That is called the stack. Okay, stacks are where you define your applications. Every stack is a new application, which is a group of services that we already defined here. If you remember our Docker Cloud YAML, this is actually a stack file. This thing defines an app, a load balancer, and a MongoDB instance, all right? Um, so what do you think I will do right now? Any guesses? Just go wild. What am I gonna do next? Yeah. Yes, I will create these services in the stack. And the easiest way to do it is just to copy paste this thing. I will just take this definition, go to the stack, create a new one, call it app, paste this, you can actually even click and upload a file like this. But yeah. So I paste it and I click create. I don't click deploy right now because probably my server is not deployed yet. Actually, let me go to Slack and check it. Ah, that's nice. So the deployment has succeeded. I'm getting the messages in on Slackbot. Check your Slack. Do you get the notifications? Raise your hands if you get the notifications. That's cool. We already have automated some of our infrastructure, right? We get automated notifications for creating a server and in the future for deleting a server. Then I can actually create, click create and deploy. Hopefully that will work. Go back, oh, it failed. Hmm, why did you fail? 
Let's see. Timeline, stack start, failed. Why? Ah, sorry, the image name. We just didn't build our image yet. Sorry, that's my mistake. Let's go to the... I was just too excited, okay? Um, let's just go to repositories and, and build it. Hopefully you build it. So when you paste it, when you update the name, it will work for you. Builds. Trigger. So anybody who completed their build, raise your hands. That's good. So you can actually deploy that. Yeah. Yes. That's perfect. That's right. Um, yeah, sorry for that. We cannot build the master branch if because there is no Docker file and Docker Compose on the master branch. So let's go to the builds, automated builds here, configure them. My setting is actually week eight. You should set the branch name to week eight because that's where our configuration is. Sorry, um, I forgot to, to mention that. So go to configure automated builds and instead of master, just type week eight. So you failed, why did you fail? If you need help, just raise your hands and some friends will come over. There's another one there, Mark. On the app. Yeah. And of course, if I go to Slack, I get all the notifications here. When the build failed, it failed again. Okay, maybe I should change the name of my repository because I deleted it to show it to you, so it just probably didn't like this. I'll just create a new one. Okay, I'm build, building it from scratch. Anybody who had a successful build? No one? One. Why is it not successful? Did you have it? It's building still. Yeah, all right. So yes, it's, it's actually building right now. Um, it failed because I deleted my repository last night. 
and probably there was an error with their caches. So I just created a repository from scratch like you did, and it's working. All right. You see it also in the logs, it says starting test in Docker Compose test YAML. So it's already testing my code. Okay, it uses the cache all the way. It got MongoDB, it runs Ava. I can see it live. And these are the, the output for test coverage. And test succeeded, that's nice. And now basically this will push the image. It's done, it's finished, build finished, all right. And I get a notification, it says repository push. Okay. And now I will go to my stack and start it. Oh, wait, I cannot start it because I need to update this. Make sure you have the right image here, all right. and start it again. You can actually also see the logs of what it's doing on your server. It's pulling the MongoDB image, it did, and then it's pulling the application image that I have, doing the same thing for the load balancer. See, it's downloading MongoDB right now. Everything is automated for you. We automated the creation of a server, we automated the building of our application, and we now automate the deployment of our application. Obviously, since it's the first time I'm deploying my app, it takes a couple of seconds because it's downloading all the software. And once it's ready, it says tech startup action on app has finished successfully. It's running already. See? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have the correct image name in your stack. So here, you should have the correct image name. It is the repository, basically, the, the repository name. Um, you cannot edit this file here. You need to click Edit up top. Yes, the, the repo that you had created here. Anybody who followed me so far, raise your hands. Cool, the others? Um, hopefully you'll be with me in a couple of minutes. If not, we can look into this um, later today. But it looks like my application is running, okay? Now, let me access my application. How will I do that? I will go to the node section. I need the IP address of this machine to interact with my application, okay? And I click on the details of the machine. It shows me the IP address already here. This is the real IP address of the server that is open to the internet. And my load balancer is actually listening on this IP on port 80 and 443. I copy this IP address. If you're on a Linux or a uh, Mac machine, you can run any text editor and edit the host file. On Windows, it's, I don't know the path, it's under C, Windows System 32 or something. Um, so you edit it and add a new line with that IP address and write the, the virtual host. This was the name of my virtual host. You can also update this on your stack file if you like. But you know when you save this, now whenever I type this URL at rmag um, on my browser, it will just go to this IP address. And my load balancer already knows how to listen to this IP address. Uh, 
host name because I already told it in my, if you remember in my Docker Cloud stack, I had this virtual host app rmag. Okay. And I point my host file to, to that thing. Now let's actually try this. I go to a new tab, do app.rmag, and I get the hello message. It's good. It works. It's online. My application is now online. Too much silence. Is it a good thing? Please. Um, well, you can actually do the same thing. You can write this IP address to your host file and you can reach my server, but the idea of this practice is you write your IP addresses, your own server's IP addresses, and access your own servers. Because we'll now be um, making a new commit and push the changes, and we'll see that it will update. So when I want the first person from my application Oh, sorry. Hmm. Yeah, there is a bug in the application. When I go to the logs, I will see that it actually failed to connect to MongoDB. I don't know why this happens, but this is fixed when I redeploy the server, the application server. It only happens on the first deployment. I redeploy it again, it will redeploy, and in that time, my application will be unreachable. In a few seconds, see, now I cannot access my app. It redeployed now. When you go to the first person's detail, it will say there is no such person. So I will open the the console, create a new person, like this, okay, it created a person, I refresh it, I get the details. So this is now running in the cloud, this is not on my machine, I already deployed the app on a server. It's actually as easy as this. Um, now I will make a change. I don't know, maybe we can update this hello message and you'll see that it's automatically updating and you know refreshing itself on the server as well. Okay. Anybody who followed me so far, who got their IP addresses from the server, added it to the host file? No? Was it too hard? The IP address um, from the nodes? You choose the node that you created, and there's the IP address. Then you edit as as the host um, in your host file. Okay, anybody could do that configuration, IP configuration. Did you do it? And you see it. Yeah. Did you? That's perfect. Yes. Um, so I'll move on with the demo and finish it, and then maybe I can you know come by and help you individually to get you on board. But now I want to demo and the Slack, yeah, service redeploy is there, it works. Now I will go and make a change, all right? I told you that I wanted to change the, the view, the person detail view. I added a new message to show it um, on the web. Anyway, let's do Docker Compose up and maybe I will see it here. Yes, locally it works. This is the app local RMAG. It points to my own local machine. I uploaded it. Um, it works. Obviously, it doesn't work on the server yet because we didn't deploy the changes. 
So let's see what I do to deploy my changes. I just turn off Docker Compose. OK, I add this, maybe this as well, the second message as well. I'm committing. Update views is the worst commit message that you can write. But why not? All right. I committed my changes. So now I'm ahead of the master by one commit. I push the changes. Okay. I pushed it. Oh. Why did this fail? I don't know. So let's go to repositories. Ah, this is actually building. See, it automatically picked up my changes. It's building now. Um, I did it when I created the repository. I clicked the GitHub icon and chose the repo, the GitHub repo, to build automatically from that. And it therefore also starts listening because in my automated build configuration, I have this week eight branch that I'm listening on. So whenever there's a new commit, it will build it. So it's building still. Yeah. There's a new web hook. It automatically sets it up for you. This will take some time. All right, it built. I received a notification repository push. The build succeeded. And now my app is actually being redeployed. If you go to the stacks, oh, it already did. It's too fast, actually. So the service is redeployed, which means it's actually live now. And I, when I refresh this, I get the updated version. This is perfect. This basically changes the face of application development. A question? Yeah. Yes, in your host file to write my IP address, you can do that. Um, so let's demonstrate that the tests are actually working, okay? So I refresh this, I get the updated messages, that's perfect. Now let's change something. For example, here, um, in my tests, I have, you know, I want to create a new person, and the name and the age should be reflected, right? right? This is the test that we wrote last week to test creation of a new, new person. Imagine that I'm a new developer coming into the code base, and I will, you know, I'm just going to mess with the internals of the application and break it, because why not? Um, and try to push it, and you'll see that it's not working. Um, so this is using the person creation API, which is here. And basically, it sends the person object. Instead, I want to send it a text message like this. This is the, the change that I'm introducing. So instead of sending back the person that I created, I'm sending back um, a, a text message. Obviously, when you run npm test here, you will see that this breaks, actually. You cannot create a new person. 
Question? Yes. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so you saw that my test actually failed because I cannot create a new person or I cannot, I don't receive the actual response. But let's imagine that I'm a very bad software engineer who doesn't test their own source code and their own changes. And I just commit this. Break person creation API because why not? And I push this, okay? Let's go to the repositories. There's a new build that is triggered because of my chain set. Oh. <laughs> this is a huge failure. What is this? <laughs> minus one day and like this is minus one second. <laughs> I don't know why that happened. But that's not related our to related to our latest change. But anyway, we're we're building this thing. The latest change, the commit ID. And hopefully we will see that it won't run. It won't redeploy. I ran the tests locally, but Docker also, Docker Cloud also runs them before building the image. So sometime soon, I hope to see this fail. Sure. This is my own IP. Um, you can basically change any of these. This should be your own machine, your own server's IP. Yes, it's taken from here um, in nodes. You click the node and the IP is here. Um, that's something you define in your stack file. Um, here, there is the virtual host that I defined. You can define your own virtual hosts. Actually, you're encouraged to define your own virtual hosts. I mean, normally you would own a domain name, right? This is actually my personal blog and I can actually demo and show you that in real life I can change the DNS of my domain add a new subdomain called app and basically it will work so if you own a domain name for the demo on Monday you can point it to a real um, domain and a real server if not it doesn't matter you can just test it locally as long as you edit your host file um, you can write anything it doesn't have to be um, a valid domain name at all. You can write anything here. As long as you add a corresponding IP address and a host name on your host file, it will work. It doesn't change. It changes only when you destroy your server. Okay, build failed. I got that notification and on Slack also. The build failed. Let's go and see. Repositories. Builds. Failed. Okay, I get the log here. It did a lot, but 
No, oh, there are a lot of problems here. Create a new person. It failed. Delete a person, rejected promise, return by test. Um, so these also failed. Fetch a person, make friends with. They all failed. Why? Because they're all using person creation API, right? Um, this is nice. This prevents any developers from messing with your production source code if your tests fail. This is why testing is really important. If you have all the API endpoints covered with your tests, you make sure they won't break with changes in the source code. And changes in the source code will happen very, very often. So you cannot manually check or test these. Let's fix this. Now, I assume the roles of a responsible developer. And I will go and fix this thing. Let's commit that. Fix broken person creation API. And push that. which will create a new version. See, since the build, build failed, there is no redeploy ha happening here. So my application didn't change. It's still running with the old version. It, it didn't update. So a person creation actually works. I can try to create a new person. And I can get that person. Person creation works. And I got the response. The response is actually a person object instead of an OK message. So my application didn't update, actually. So OK, while it's updating, I can wrap it up. Because this is basically everything you need in terms of deploying your applications. For me, it still feels like there's something missing. Like, it can't be this easy, right? We just set up a repository. We created the server by just clicking a few buttons. And everything else happens automatically. Let me show you scaling the application. So you go to services, to app, for example. Oh, it's rebuilt. OK. Let it update again. So this time the build succeeded. Let's, let's see if it did. Yeah. Build finished. It succeeded. See? Success. So it actually redeployed. So there's a new version. Um, we were talking about scaling our application. I go to the services, click app, which is my application that's running. And I say, I will scale it up to 10 containers, OK? And I will click Scale. That is basically all that is necessary to spawn multiple containers. And see, they're all online right now. That's all. Now I have 10 containers running. If I had my payment details here, I could actually scale this node cluster the same way, this would create new servers for me, OK? And yeah, it asks for my credit card details. I won't give it that right now. But if I did, I could scale up and create new machines, all right? And then when I redeploy my app, which has 10 containers, the containers would be distributed equally among my machines. So if I created five machines, each machine would have two containers. That is how you scale. That is how you scale your application horizontally to multiple machines. I don't even know their IP addresses. I just know the IP address of a single machine, of the load balancer, of the app, uh, of the server that holds the load balancer. And the rest, I don't care. It automatically handles it for me. This is amazing. This is the level of automation that only a handful of companies have in real life. And now you have this knowledge. And now you can actually do this for your own projects. There is nothing else involved. 
you automatically test your apps, you automatically deploy your apps. This is continuous integration, which um, builds your source code and tests it automatically, and continuous deployment, which at the end of a successful build, it's deployed to your servers. And when there is no successful build, it doesn't deploy anything. No configuration at all, and you get free updates as, um, as Slack messages. This is kind of the future already within our reach. My question. My question is regarding server, like we created a physical server and find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are in Frankfurt. They are deployed to that specific server. That means that the specific server Yeah. And in fact, I can create another node cluster in, I don't know, um, in another part of the world, let's say in San Francisco, and by using labels, that's where the labels come into play. By using labels for deployment, I can say, you know, deploy four of these app containers to San Francisco and four of them to um, Frankfurt. And I could have some intelligent mechanisms to redirect people to, like from the US to San Francisco, from the Europe to Germany, so that the latency is lower and, you know, you have geographical um, scalability as well. This is all. Did you like it? Is that all? I thought this would, this would be more, um, yeah, I don't know, exciting. <laughs> to digest, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, but yeah, that's true. Like. You can now ditch the infrastructure teams in your companies. You basically have everything here. Um, and this, it's as simple as this. It doesn't really get much more complex than this. Yes, you create more services. For example, some of the applications use Redis as a database, as an additional database. You add another server, a service. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Of course, there is one thing I'm not telling you. The database um, is kind of volatile right now uh, because we didn't actually give it a hard disk, a volume that we own. And when you destroy the node, it will just be gone. Um, cloud providers give you the, the ability to create separate volumes, separate hard disks that are, of course, still virtual. Um, but that you can attach and detach from servers. So you want your data to be stable, to be always there and replicated, copied over and over again with backups, um, so that whenever you lose your servers, it doesn't matter, the, the hard disk will be there. So obviously what you do is, and this is where Docker Cloud cannot help you, what you do is you bring in your own database server, uh, you just don't create it through this interface, but there is bring your own node functionality here. And, oh. and that obviously requires a credit card again. But if you do that, you can create a stable stationary database server in a cloud provider and then add it to Docker Cloud so that it's available to your applications and that machine, you manage yourself. You manage the hard disk. You manage the backups. Um, you have a special hard disk that's attached to, to that machine that is uh, backed up separately. So even if you lose that machine, it will work. So that's a manual effort. But for most of the use cases, this thing will also just work. What also you can do is you can specialize one of these nodes. You can do SSH logins into these nodes actually, and you can have a stationary folder on one of these servers and use it as a volume on your MongoDB um, so that even if you run, even if you created your um, nodes through Docker Cloud with 
automatic creation, you can still get a specific folder that you can back up manually or automatically as well. Actually, there are mechanisms which we also use in production. Um, you deploy them as Docker Cloud containers, just like we did um, now. It just takes a backup of your database every hour and sends it to a backup server that you have. So that's also automated. You don't do anything. Um, and you can roll back from those backups. But they are a little bit advanced setups. Um, most of the time, this is just all it is. Um, yeah, I really don't have anything else to tell you. If you have any questions, please shoot. And I have a question. If you have a handkerchief or something, I just spilled some coke here on the floor. <laughs> Which is already absorbed by the, by the green carpet anyway. <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. Um, do you have something? Okay. I mean, it's, it's not huge. It's just a, a stain of this size. Hopefully, it will be gone in a few minutes. <laughs> Any questions? Please. Yes. Um, the easiest way to do rollbacks here is you check out a previous comment and push it as the, the branch. Um, some orchestration tools like Kubernetes have built-in rollbacks, which rolls back to the previous build automatically, um, but it, they're a little bit convoluted to use. I would, this is very controversial, but I would actually recommend setting up a system so that you never regret and you never need to roll back. Make sure you have automated tests and make sure you are, you have solid steps forward so that you don't have to roll back. Um, actually, maybe you can even measure your success by the number of rollbacks you have to do in production. Um, if you have one every month, that's maybe a little bit too much. If you have more frequent rollbacks, there is something seriously wrong with your organization. You need to review your engineering practices. Um, ideally, like once or twice a year, that's fine. Um, because some things may slip to production, but other than that, you shouldn't be rolling back. But, <clears throat> sorry, that's a functionality that is not well su supported by Docker Cloud unless you check out to a different commit, you cannot roll it back here, um, which should have been added because I understand that people love the ability of rolling back, um, but they don't support it currently unless you trigger a new build with, with a new push. Any other questions? No questions at all, please. Yeah. Um, no, you can't. Because there is no service listening on the background without a virtual host. So basically, what happens when you go to the IP address directly is I get nothing. Because there is nothing um, in my infrastructure that is listening to this bare IP address. I have some service that listens to a virtual host. So unless you give that virtual host, it won't work. But what you can do is, if you had that additional 3,000 in your stack file here, if you had that additional 3,000, and let's do it. Save it. It's updating. And I will redeploy my app. Why did you fail? <laughs> Why? Or oh, maybe it didn't like the, the syntax. Ah, I scaled it up, right? And they all want to listen to the same port, but they can't because that port is shared by one. So I scale it down. It shuts down all the other services. 
You can also scale down your node clusters like this. So it's really easy. Actually, you can automatically tie this to a webhook to your monitoring system. So whenever there's load on your servers, it automatically scales it up. Okay, now I can redeploy this. Now it will work. Okay, it worked. So now I have that IP address. When I write port 3000, my application will be there. So this works, but it's not advised to use it like this. Therefore, we never have that additional port mapping um, in our stack file. There is no need to expose your internal services. Just expose the load balancer and use a virtual host. Perfect. Then, um, technically, the course is over. So, I'm kind of not allowed to give you homework anymore. But of course, I will. Just make this work. Um, especially if, if you're presenting on Monday. All right. Let's spend the weekend to get Docker Cloud work. And if you already own a domain name, then again, let's point a subdomain to your application so that people can check out their application from their phones or their laptops. If not, just demonstrate it locally, just as I did with, with a local host config. But it would be really awesome if we could see some demos that included Docker Cloud um, on Monday. And yeah, I, I basically can't believe that we are at the end of the class. So there's no class next week. It's all. We did it all. We created an application. We used the database. We deployed the application. We now know how to scale the application to millions of users, actually, by just scaling up um, a slider on the front end. You can create more servers and more services. And that's all. Thank you for making this happen. This was a huge challenge and a huge source of inspiration for me. And I'm really proud of, of your progress so far. Um, and I'm really happy if I could contribute at least something to your development careers. And see you on Monday. Thank you.